by the afternoon with a decent amount of sunshine across much of England, Wales and also western parts of Scotland. But that southeasterly wind will be bringing in some cloud which is likely to linger across eastern, northeastern parts and a significant wind chill will make it feel pretty cold under that cloud too. Looking ahead to the weekend and after a dry start for most on Saturday, a weather system pushing its way up from the southwest will lead to a fairly wet story for many of us as we go through the weekend. The rain likely to be heaviest and most frequent across southern areas. Further north it's probably going to be a bit patchier, a bit more showery and mostly light too. Temperatures picking up on Saturday, dropping down again. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. We have a ton of top prizes to be won in our spring giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven, and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as I was, and they're going to get even more money this time around, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats, and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text PRIZE to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Hello, good evening, it's me, Jacob Rees-Mogg, on State of the Nation tonight. New revelations have suggested that the European Union is still controlling our laws, according to a report in The Guardian. Chancellor privately confessed to backbench Tory MPs that VAT reforms are limited because of EU rules. Eight years on from our vote for independence. And as the worklessness crisis is expected to continue to deepen in the post-pandemic era, the OBR, one that always gets forecast wrong, has predicted net migration will average 350,000 over the next five years. Let's hope this is another case when they're wrong and that it's an underestimate. A new study has suggested British children are being indoctrinated by left-wing causes as a report revealed a sharp increase in mentions of fashionable trends like transgenderism in stories written by children under 12 years old. Plus, two preachers were arrested on the streets of Somerset, God's own county, for the crime of preaching the Holy Gospel. 
in a victory for free speech, their case has been dropped, and I'll be speaking to one of them shortly. State of the Nation starts now. I'll also be joined by my most intellectual panel this evening, GB News' senior political commentator Nigel Nelson and the former Conservative MP Michael Brown. As always, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the programme. Email me, mailmog at gbnews.com. But now it's what you've all been waiting for, the news of the day with Sam Francis. Jacob, thank you very much. Good evening from the newsroom. The headlines just after 8 o'clock. Government ministers are today challenging Labour to set out its own funding plans after the opposition party backed the government's decision to cut national insurance. The non-DOM tax status will be scrapped with the aim of raising revenue to make up for the two pence cut. But figures suggest any benefits for the taxpayer are likely to be cancelled out by an expected rise in council tax. Well, earlier Jeremy Hunt told GB News that his budget is proof that the government's fiscal plan is working. We want to end the unfairness. Um, the direction of travel we've gone is to reduce uh, national insurance by one third. The fact that Labour are opposing this today is really because Labour don't have any plans to reduce taxation. It just sort of makes my point for me. Their plan is basically that tax should remain at its current levels. We say we don't have to accept the status quo. If you make difficult decisions, if you stick to our plan for the economy that's seen inflation falling and growth starting to rise, uh, we can bring down the tax burden. The UK tonight has pledged a further £125 million of military support to Ukraine in another major move against Putin's invasion. Here's our Home and Security editor Mark White with more on what that announcement tonight will mean for Ukraine's war efforts. This extra package announced by Grant Shapps on a visit to Ukraine is very significant. Hundreds of pounds and millions of pounds uh, in extra commitment from the UK to provide 10,000 military drones. Now, the vast majority will be first-person view drones, FPV drones, which can loiter over the battle space and drop their munitions on Russian tanks and artillery. But it will also provide 1,000 new one-way attack drones. In addition to that, more maritime attack drones. Mark White, our Home and Security Editor, speaking earlier. The government will attempt to overturn amendments to its flagship immigration policy after it suffered heavy defeats in the House of Lords. Commons leader Penny Mordaunt confirmed today that the safety of Rwanda bill will return to the Lords on the 18th of this month. MPs will then get a chance to debate and vote on any amendments in the following week. The government's plan would compel judges to deem Rwanda as a safe country and clear the way to send people who cross the channel in small boats on a one-way flight to the African nation. MPs have warned that the post office is not fit to run any compensation schemes for victims of the Horizon IT scandal. The Business and Trades Committee published recommendations for delivering payments to hundreds of victims and described the effort so far as an abject failure. They say that an independent body should instead be appointed to the process. The chairman described it as a national disgrace that only £1 out of every £5 allocated for compensation has so far been paid out. And Joe Biden is set to announce an emergency mission to build a temporary port on the Gaza coast so that humanitarian aid can be shipped into the region. The US president will make that announcement in his State of the Union speech later tonight. It's also reported he will use his fourth address to dispel any concerns about his age and highlight the difference between his track record and that of his likely opponent, Donald Trump. Those are the headlines. For more, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For now, though, it's back to Jacob in Westminster. Well, could you believe it? The European Union appears to still be in control of Britain's laws. The Guardian has revealed that the Chancellor privately admitted to backbench MPs, not including me, which is why I feel able to tell you. If he'd told me, I'd feel that I'd been told confidentially and I couldn't pass it on. But the feeble increase in yesterday's VAT threshold increase was restricted by European Union laws. Yesterday, the VAT threshold for businesses increased from £85,000 to £90,000. 
It appears the Chancellor wanted to take it further, which he should have done. It's a very good policy, but couldn't because of the Windsor Framework deal signed with the European Union last year. The framework crystallised the Northern Ireland Protocol, which separates Northern Ireland from the rest of the United Kingdom, forcing it into compliance with the EU's single market. But if His Majesty's Government had continued with Boris's plans with the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, that would have unilaterally withdrawn us from components of the protocol. In other words, if we had stuck to Boris's plan, we would have been able to increase our VAT threshold. Now, why does this matter? It matters because VAT thresholds discourage business, especially smaller ones, from increasing their revenue. So if you're a tradesman whose business earned £87,000 under the new regime and you're offered £4,000 worth of business just before the end of the financial year, it's in your interest to reject that business because if you accepted it, you would go over the threshold and in the following year, you would have to apply 20% VAT to all the services you sold, making you significantly less competitive. So a £5,000 increase, which we saw yesterday, is mere nickel and diming. It helps a bit, but not much. And thank you to Christopher Hope for raising this point with the Chancellor earlier on today. You, you haven't cut income tax. Some thought you might do. Jacob Rees Smog, um, your colleague in Parliament, who also works at GB News, he said this kind of nickel and diming won't make a lot of difference. Have you been fiddling around when you could, you could be more dramatic, more, more political, maybe? Well, um, it's not nickel and diming to cut national insurance payments by one third. That means in three months. In three yeah. months. That means that the person on the average wage is going to see their tax bill fall by about. £900. That is a very significant reduction in taxation. And it's fair enough to say that the national insurance cut is significant, but in the grand scheme of things, it just lets people keep about £450 a year on average, which is less than £40 a month. What we need is some bold and ambitious changes. We need to have a taxation system that encourages economic growth and creates the least friction whilst raising the money that needs to be raised. That's why we need to look at reforming stamp duty, which would help homeowners and potential homeowners, and to get rid of IR35, which discourages entrepreneurships and holds businesses back, as does the low level of the VAT threshold. IR35 basically assumes that self-employed people are tax avoiders. It's also time to increase tax thresholds in line with inflation, because that's having an effect on people across the country and eats into the cut in national insurance very significantly, particularly on retired people who don't pay national insurance. But we need to get spending under control, and we're continuing with real terms increases, which is a mistake. If we put all these bold cuts together, if we make it work, then we will have a chance with supply-side reforms, of planning reforms, of welfare reforms, not just winning the next election, but even more importantly, improving in Disraeli's terms the condition of the people, far beyond the expectations of the OBR, the IMF, the OECD, and all the other Brexit-hating, British-bashing, acronymised institutions that have become so encumbered by bureaucratic liberal groupthink. As always, let me know your thoughts. Mail Mog at GB News. I'm joined now by the former Labour advisor, Mike Barclay. Um, Mike, thank you very much for joining me. It's quite an interesting revelation in The Guardian that um, the Chancellor was going around telling Tory MPs that he'd have liked to have raised the threshold more, but couldn't because of the Windsor framework. Well, if that is what the Chancellor said, then he wasn't being entirely truthful. He can raise the VAT threshold to whatever he likes within Great Britain. In Scotland, Northern Ireland, he can raise it to 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 if he wants to. The only place where we can't raise it is in Northern Ireland, and that is because Northern Ireland, to protect, or to, to protect the absence of a hard border on the island of Ireland, is part of the single market for goods, as was agreed when we left the European Union. And that means that Northern Ireland has to abide by VAT rules uh, across across the um, uh, across the rest of the EU, and the maximum there is a hundred thousand euros. So we're we're still within that limit. So Jeremy Hunt has chosen to maintain his state. But, but we're a United yeah. Kingdom. Uh, that's a good thing. But we're a United Kingdom, and therefore to differentiate between GB and Northern Ireland would be problematic. And why do we care about the single market? That's a matter of the EU, not for us. Well, it's not about caring about it. It's about abiding by an international agreement that we signed only a matter of. 
you know, a small number of years ago. We have no option other than renegotiating it to obey the agreement that we well, signed. Because no, we're, that's, we're that's a, not, a country that believes in... That's not right. That, that's not right. The, the protocol had within it um, the intention for it to be reformed, and we had a piece of legislation before Parliament that had passed through the House of Commons uh, that would have restored proper independence to Northern Ireland. And the whole United Kingdom voted as one country to come out, not, not just for Great Britain to come out of the European Union. Well, if you remember, the people of Northern Ireland voted by a significant margin to stay in the European Union. But we voted as a United Kingdom, not as um, well, regions of the United the Kingdom. Consent, you'll recognise that the people of Northern Ireland voted by a significant margin to stay in, and they also, mm. in the Assembly elections they had in 2022, about two-thirds of um, people elected to Stormont, to their, to their Assembly, voted, in fact, for, for parties that are in favour of the protocol and therefore in favour of this VAT arrangement. But, no, they voted to remain... Or they haven't had a vote because it hasn't met the threshold for a poll um, no, no, to I'm remain part about, of the United Kingdom. About, and the United Kingdom has left the European Union and they, have, they should no, have the full rights of people in the election. United Kingdom. In the Stormont elections last year, people could vote for a number of different political parties, obviously. Some of those parties were against the protocol. Some of those parties were before, before the protocol. The people of Northern Ireland voted by about two-thirds for, for members of the Stormont Assembly who were in favour of the protocol. So they had an option to vote for parties that were against it, and most people chose to vote for parties that were for the protocol. But we left as a United Kingdom, that's the fundamental point, and Northern Ireland wants to remain, as far as one can tell, within the United Kingdom, and they are being deprived of the benefits of that uh, because of a protocol that makes them, to some extent, second-class I mean, citizens. You will, recall, you will recall, because you've been a member of Parliament throughout this process, that we've had long debates about Northern Ireland and about a settlement for Northern Ireland. And we could have put a border across the island of Ireland, of course, but that is politically impossible, given the context of Northern but Ireland and uh, Southern yeah, Ireland and the peace been, process. That would have been a choice for know. the European Union. We never, we, had we, we were never going to put a border in. That's, that's been one we're of the good. fallacies. We never had to put there. a border in. In that case, Jacob, as we, as we all concluded, there is one, well, there are two further options. One is for the whole of the United Kingdom to stay in the customs union. We decided we didn't that's, want to do that. That's not right. The, that's the not other right. Alternative, the only other alternative is to have a customs border down the Irish Sea, which is what we've got. Now, no, significant we, we didn't need to do either of those. Exactly. We could have just border. said to the European <laughs> Union, this is your problem. You sort it. Anyway, we're going to have to end there, because I'm joined now by my panel, GB News's senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson, and the former Tory MP... Um, Michael Brown. Um, Nigel, it's quite a revelation in The Guardian that the Windsor framework tail is wagging the UK's economic policy dog. Well, the Windsor framework did a better job than the original protocol, but not the ideal job. And the trouble about all this is that um, everyone went hurtling towards Brexit without really thinking what we were going to do about the bit of the UK that shares a land border with Ireland and keep the, the Northern Ireland peace deal intact. So I tend to agree with Mike there. I mean, the way the VAT rules are working is that uh, UK VAT can apply to alcohol, thanks to the Windsor framework, and to anything that you can't move around, like, um, say, a heat pump or something like that. When it comes to other things, EU rules must apply, and in this case, so as not to disadvantage EU companies, and that's because of the land border, and that is the point about keeping it open. But the point I was trying to make to Mike was that this was a matter for the Irish government. The UK government was never going to put a land border in, no. and was the EU, and that we've sort of accepted that we have to change our systems in Northern Ireland just in case the EU decides to do something unreasonable. Well, no, it's the other way around, isn't it? That we decided to actually to leave Europe. That was our decision, decision <laughs> although uh, Northern, Northern Ireland voted against that 56 but, to 44 But surely once we've left, then what they do in relation to us is their business, not ours. Well, That's up to them. Yes, but the, but the point that the EU would make is why should they change their rules because we've decided to leave? But it's up to them. And so, well, but the, the issue remains at the, at the end of it all is how do you maintain the peace that we've got from the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland and, to, and keep that border open? I, I, I just don't believe, Michael, that the Irish government would ever have allowed a hard border to be created. I've always thought this was a straw man. And we're now seeing real consequences of it, because raising the VAT threshold, which Nigel Lawson was a great advocate of, 
is one of those things that really helps small businesses. Absolutely. If I was still the MP for Scunthorpe or Cleethorpes, I would simply say to the Chancellor Exchequer, uh, I'm not going to have my constituency decided on the VAT threshold for self-employed people uh, in particular uh, by uh, some EU rule. I would have actually, if I was a brave Chancellor, uh, I would have said I'm going to increase the threshold to whatever I think. I know that I can't do it for Northern Ireland. That would have uh, then caused, perfectly reasonably, all the uh, uh, Ulster members of Parliament from all the political parties to put pressure on our government, but they would also put pressure, possibly the SDLP and Sinn Féin uh, members of Parliament, to put pressure on the Irish government. I would have actually taken the political risk and said in the House of Commons, I want to raise it by £10,000, £20,000. I can't do it for Northern Ireland for these reasons. But, of course, all this goes to show that the Windsor Framework uh, Agreement that was signed with great uh, uh, fanfare last year is not the final answer on this. I suspect if there were to be another government and the temperature will cool down, uh, if we take Mr Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer at his word, uh, the Tories got Brexit done, I intend to make Brexit work. That's something for his agenda were he uh, uh, to be but the next Prime Minister. If this budget is a budget for an election which you would ah, think it that's might another be, matter. then shouldn't it be delivering on the benefits of having left the European Union? And one of them is raising VAT thresholds. And if you look at the voters who've gone off to reform, who are saying they're yeah. going to stay at home, they are mainly part of that 2019 coalition that is pro-Brexit. Right, but there's an even better way. Uh, I recall uh, when I was on political death row, uh, six months before the 1997 general election, one of the best budgets ever that really was trying to win votes. It didn't, by the way. The 1996 November budget by Kenneth Clark, which of course was leaked to the Daily Mirror uh, the day before, uh, and that was why Perda came to an end. Mm -hmm. um, that budget reduced income tax across the board, pensioners, everybody, by 1p in the pound. The tax thresholds, of course, we had the Rooker Wise Amendment that no Conservative government, because the Tory opposition, you were eight at the time, uh, joined with uh, Jeff Rooker and Audrey Wise, the two Labour MPs, the Rooker Wise Amendment. Uh, in the 1996 budget, six months before the uh, 97 election, uh, the uh, thresholds were increased three and a half times above inflation, which was written into statute. The biggest crime of this government has been to abandon the policy of David Cameron, on which he was elected in and, 2010. And just remind me how much difference this budget made? Uh, this budget yesterday? No, 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 the Kenneth Clark one. Oh, well, uh, the, 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 there were other things. Uh, increase in the uh, uh, inheritance tax threshold, economic growth of 2.5%, GDP as a proportion of uh, national income just over 1%, and it made not a jot of difference. I cheered with my order paper, and six months later, I was gone. Is that the lesson? Is it from 1996 that we should be looking back and saying, actually... It's not a budget that will change things. It's much wider than that. And it's how do you get through to the voters in the six months? Yeah, I don't think this budget will actually change the, the, the dial at all. Um, and probably when we get to the end of all this, that what is going to really determine this election is the feeling, as in 1997, time for change. Oh, dear. Change, change. Aren't things bad enough already? Anyway, thank you to my panel. Coming up next, that was Palmerston, by the way. Um, uh, as worklessness is expected to worsen, mass migration has been predicted to average at 350,000 a year over the next five years. Plus, is it unchristian to judge others? Free Speech Nation. Sunday nights from 7 p.m. Our first question comes from Elliot. Elliot, hello. Is, is Canada now an authoritarian state? Elliot, I think it's been an authoritarian state for a while. I mean, uh, under Trudeau, this is a new thing now, and this is coming from the Justice Minister, uh, who has Arif Virani, and he has defended this new power for their online harms bill. That sounds familiar. We've got something quite similar. And they're saying they can now impose house arrest on someone who they think might commit a hate crime in the future, right? That's scary stuff, isn't it? 
there's obviously a very dark side to this because you can't, or you sh in my opinion, you shouldn't be able to imprison somebody before they've done anything. Right. Well, it is Canada. Well. And, <laughs> and uh, I know you, you in this country, you kind of kind of respect Canada as a country. America didn't even know it was a country until recently. <laughs> and I think that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to, to show themselves to be different than America. I think America has a responsibility to, to invade. <laughs> you know what? I do. You know, you're, you're kidding, but it may come down to this. It's, or this may just be a... Pr a pr yeah, maybe. Well, I just think it's ridiculous that the idea yeah. of arresting someone... I mean, our government's yeah. bad enough, and the Scottish government's out of control, the Irish government's right. out of control. They're all talking about... I mean, the Irish government's got a new hate crimes bill where they're talking about they can seize your phone if they suspect you might have some material that could potentially yeah. stir up hatred. I mean, for God's sake, what does that mean? Your phone's full of that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, well, <laughs> the government knows that. Yeah. But, um, but the, you're, you're right, but it has to do with a bigger picture, which is Canada has sucked itself in on the big team world. So, sorry, I'm going to say it. It's big team world. And what they're, what they're doing, this is not even a free speech issue. This is just about silencing uh, dissent well, that's against the Canadian government. It has nothing to do with openness and talk, whatever. It's like saying, we don't want these people to spread their you opinions, know, opinions. Dangerous opinions. That's what speech codes and hate speech laws always do. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Well, welcome back. We've been discussing taxes and BAT and so on, and we have been getting your mail mogs in. Graham says something I agree with. The monumental rise in corporation tax is far more damaging to small businesses than a small VAT threshold rise. Well, when I was in Boris Johnson's cabinet, I opposed that ridiculous rise very vigorously. Uh, Richard says, Jacob, why didn't you try for the Chancellor's job? You would do a much better job than Hunt. Well, uh, there's no vacancy, I think is the answer to that. And Robin, I'm a firm believer that the threshold on student loans has an equally, if not more, damaging impact on the incentive for young people to work or to work hard to earn more. And Robin, I think you're on to a very good point, which is that we have these um, very high marginal rates at certain stages in the tax system. It's student loans, child benefit and so on. And that ought to be sorted out. That's exactly what Nigel Lawson did. It's simplicity, simple and fair. Amidst the backdrop of yesterday's budget, the Office for Budget Responsibility has suggested that not only is Britain's worklessness crisis expected to get even worse, currently sits at about 5.5 million people on out-of-work benefits, but also that net migration is expected to average around 350,000 for each of the next five years. As troubling as both of these predictions are, the good news is that the ABR is usually wrong, so let's hope that these predictions are too high. But with net migration last year exceeding 650,000, the immigration prediction may be overly optimistic. Well, my panel is still with me, GB News' senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson, and the former Tory MP, Michael Brown. Michael, the immigration issue is one that constituents up and down the country are completely fed up with. I think it's one of the things that has done the biggest damage to the Tories' credibility from the tens of thousands promise uh, of David Cameron prior to 2010. If we're still running at 350,000, that's just too high, isn't it? It's much more than people expect. Well, it certainly is, is, is far too high. It's uh, breaching the uh, manifesto commitments that uh, successive prime ministers and home secretaries have given uh, over the last 14 years. Uh, and the blunt truth is, let's leave the boat people on one side. Uh, this is legal migration, allegedly. But there's a wonderful article in the Times today by Ian Martin uh, that makes the point that um, we don't know how many immigrants there actually are in the country. These are only estimates, and he says that they're probably underestimates. And the blunt truth is, um, 
there is a conspiracy among ministers and civil servants to want and need uh, more immigrants because of that figure that you gave just now, 5.5 million people. In my day, uh, people that weren't working used to be called unemployed. Uh, and the uh, way that um, this government covers up real unemployment, uh, that in, I understand my generation of, of politicians understood unemployment, is to wrap it all up in this worklessness caused by all sorts of mental illness, out-of-work benefits. Uh, and the reason for that is because we we insist on replacing them with immigrants. The government n says it needs immigrants. It doesn't. But the immigrants undercut the wages of the British worker. Well, and, they won't under, under the new rules. I mean, the, the new rules that come in means that, that a, a migrant will have to be paid the same amount as a but British worker. But don't they inevitably, just simply on the argument of supply and demand, that if you increase the supply and the demand remains level, the price falls? Well, yes. I mean, uh, I mean it's better than the 20% cut. Yes, I mean, it, it, but at least we have a level playing field as a yeah. starting point. The, the, the issue here is that um, the one thing that Jeremy Hunt did yesterday was bang on constantly about not relying on migrants for growth. Um, then he goes and uh, nicks Labour's policy on the, the non-DOM tax, raises £2.7 billion, but instead of spending that on what Labour would have done, which would have been two million more operations to get people off hospital waiting lists, he spent... The, he spent it on tax cuts. Had he been, been a responsible Chancellor with the country's best interest at heart, he'd have used that money to reduce NHS waiting lists and getting people back to work. That is the but, way but, but to actually, get he, British workers back into the But he the spent jobs. a lot of time on the NHS. And what he pointed out was the public sector has seen a decline in productivity of 6%, which he's trying to get back. And that must surely be the first target. That doesn't require more money. That just requires people to work in the same way as they did in 2018. But they can't work if they're ill. So if you've got one in eight people waiting for... Um, no, this uh, is in the public sector. So this is in the NHS. We assume all the people in the NHS who aren't working aren't ill. Well, no, but, but, but there, has to, there, there will still be people who are on, in any industry who are these 2.5 million people who are sick, waiting lists which are huge. If you can treat them, you will get more people who are able to work and will go back to work. And that's where that 2.7 mil, uh, billion I, I, I non tax should have gone. This, um, I, I agree with him on many things, but this is one where I disagree. I simply do not believe that 5.5 million people on out-of-work benefits uh, are on those out-of-work benefits because for many of them it is attractive to be on those benefits for uh, and, and I really think that we do have to go back to uh, half the, long -term uh, the, the, the 1980s uh, yeah I'm prepared to accept that there will be a proportion Nigel I simply well, don't half. believe yes. that 10% <laughs> yeah. of the population who are of working age simply can't work if, if the economic well, circumstances with the migration were sorted out. They would. I agree with Michael on that. The other concerning... <laughs> sorry about that, Nigel. <laughs> the other concerning component of yesterday's budget is the effect that it's expected to have on the 8 million or so pensioners in Britain. On average, those that have retired are expected to face a £1,000 real-term cut to their yearly income, owing to a six-year freeze on income tax threshold. While the Chancellor has vowed to stick to the triple lock promise for pensioners, his focus during yesterday's budget was on cutting national insurance by 2%, a tax that senior citizens do not pay. Well, I'm joined now by two people who, though they, they look like mere youths, the schoolboys of GB News, are in fact pensioners. So I'll go to GB News' senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson, first. Are you at all miffed? that you're one of the losers in the budget, one of eight million? No, because I don't think you should have made tax cuts anyway. Um, <laughs> so on the basis of that, which I've said all along, on the basis of that, um, I think the budget was um, uh, misconstrued in the way that he put it together. Uh, but it will, do, it will do your party an awful lot of damage. I mean, the pensioners tend to vote Tory. Maybe I'm the exception, but pensioners do. There's um, hope for you yet. <laughs> I don't think they're going to get there somehow. Um, but the but the other thing is, is how many people have been dragged in. You're now talking about 12.6 million pensioners in this country, of which now um, 8.5 million of them are now paying income tax. And 1.5 million are actually in work and, of course, don't pay national insurance, sure. don't benefit from it. When he comes, when he's able to actually do some tax cutting, it's thresholds that need to be addressed. As you said earlier, uh, I, well, we agree on that one. Um, Michael... Uh, I'm not going to ask you to be as philanthropic uh, as Nigel, but what I am going to ask is about the politics of this, because the older yeah, you get, the more yeah, likely yeah, you are to vote Tory. Yeah. 
Look, and isn't it wise to look after your own voters? I was brought up by Labour governments and Tory governments on the idea, after that famous Rooker Wise Amendment, that you index link every single year. It's it used to be written into the law, no chance to could get out of it, that you index link the personal allowance, whether you're an old age pensioner, age 90, a well off pensioner, poorly pensioner. That was the way you did it. So it's bad politics. Now, I, I think we've got to be a little bit fair to Jeremy Hunt. Pensioners have been well looked after with the triple lock. Uh, I'm bunged £500 every November for my heating allowance. Uh, and as Ken Clark said, he gets it as well. Uh, I would much rather keep the triple lock. Um, I think it needs to be kept for the poorer pensioners. Um, tax those of us that are fortunate enough to have a private pension, pay a, uh, and we are paying our tax uh, anyway, unlike the, uh, the, the working population. But I think politics-wise, they should have extended the thresholds. Uh, and we're going to get to the bizarre situation, by the way, where some pensioners are just going to breach the current £12,570 limit, uh, and they're suddenly going to get a tax return. They probably won't be able to operate a computer, and that's going to cause the Tories a lot of trouble. Yeah, absolutely. And as a constituency MP, pensioners do come in with their um, tax coding not fully aware of what it means, yeah. and this will certainly create problems. But many pensioners, uh, uh, Jacob, probably haven't been paying tax for many years. They might have a 1000 or two. By the, by the way, they can only have £500 of savings before they've got to pay tax. So there will be a lot of pensioners that are suddenly going to be having to complete a tax return for the first time. And this is my concern about the structure of the budget, that it sort of takes from one to give to the mm. other, and that... It's marvellous to reduce national insurance by 2p, and if the aim is to abolish it, that's a really important um, yeah, transformation of the tax system. If it ever happens. But doing it by holding thresholds back makes an awful lot of losers as well as winners. Yes, I mean, and pensioners are losers here. So um, if you'd done income tax, that would obviously have, have benefited everybody. But I appreciate it is inflationary. It is a problem for Scotland that has six rates where we've got, got three. So I can understand it's a difficult one to do. But if you are going to do it, that's the place to go. As I said, then what he should then do is not have done tax cuts now. If we assume the, he's got one more um, fiscal event before the end of the year, uh, that's when he should have done it once inflation was down to the Bank of England target. And Jacob, just to add to that, bearing in mind that you and all your colleagues in 2010 stood on a manifesto commitment that we would extend uh, the personal allowance and traded on the fact in 2015 at that election, look what we have done, that's all been un undone by that chap who was Chancellor Exchequer about four years ago, a chap called Rishi Sunak, I think, started it. <laughs> <coughs> Great man. Anyway, thank you to my panel. Coming up, has woke ideology infected our youth? And don't forget, and this will astonish you, there's some news from Somerset that is not entirely propitious. Good evening. Here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. A few showers and a touch of frost for some of us tonight, then a mostly fine day tomorrow. At the moment, the UK is sandwiched in between low pressure around the Bay of Biscay and high pressure across Scandinavia, leading to a strengthening southeasterly flow. Through the night, we are going to see a few showers, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland. Also, some showery outbreaks for northeast England and eastern parts of Scotland. Could be a little bit of sleet or snow over the higher ground here. Elsewhere, a mostly dry picture with some clear skies, particularly towards the south of England, also western Scotland, under which we could see a touch of frost first thing on Friday morning in any sheltered rural spots. Otherwise, as we go through tomorrow then, any showery outbreaks across northern areas will largely die out. So for much of the country, it will be a dry picture by the afternoon with a decent amount of sunshine across much of England, Wales and also western parts of Scotland. But that southeasterly wind will be bringing in some cloud, which is likely to linger across eastern northeastern parts and a significant wind chill will make it feel pretty cold under that cloud too. Looking ahead to the weekend and after a dry start for most on Saturday, a weather system pushing its way up from the southwest will lead to a fairly wet story for many of us as we go through the weekend. The rain likely to be heaviest and most frequent across southern areas. Further north it's probably going to be a bit patchier, a bit more showery and mostly light too. Temperatures picking up on Saturday dropping down again. Thank you.
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Well, thank you for sticking with us. We've been talking about uh, immigration and the economic consequences. And Bob says, 5.5 million unemployed but 7 million awaiting treatment. Any correlation? Rajiv, here in northwest London, there are thousands of visa overstairs who came in on visitors' visas but appear to be now permanently settled. What is the government doing about this? And that's a very good question. And Hugh says, I think that pensions should be exempt from tax. Well, I, yes, perhaps um, people with four children in Hungary are exempt from tax, which seems to be a jolly good scheme, as I've got six. A new study shows that creative writing among school children under 12 years old has taken a concerning turn. Gone are the days of fairy tales, of um, dinosaurs and all of that, when an analysis of 44,000 stories shows that more common themes for writing include gender fluidity, transgenderism and Gaza. Researchers from Oxford University Press reviewed stories submitted by children aged 5 to 11 to the BBC Loving's 500 Words competition. It concluded that stories this year addressed themes of gender and noted a 20-fold rise in mentions of Gaza. Well, my panel is still with me, um, Nigel Nelson and Michael Brown. Uh, Michael... Is this indoctrination going on in schools? Well, it's certainly very unhealthy. I mean, a child between 5 and 11 uh, really does need to be protected as much as possible from the horrors of the real world. I know eventually, you know, it, it catches up with you only too well. I remember, oh, it was a long time ago, uh, being that age, uh, and, um, you know, I hadn't got very much beyond uh, noddy and big ears and all the rest of it. But I think a child's childhood a child's childhood, should be as idyllic as is possible. Now, that's, it's bad enough with all the horrors uh, of poverty and single-parent families uh, that make childhood difficult. But I have a horrible feeling uh, that this is being encouraged by uh, the educational establishment. We do have a thing called the Secretary of State for Education. What does she do all day? Well, that's a very good question. Nigel, what do you think she I does think all day? This is, I think that this is really good news. I mean, th th what this is showing is that children are actually aware aware of the world around them. I and mean, should we celebrate that rather than criticise it? Um, and if they're going on about uh, transgender issues, maybe the, the, us in the media should stop banging on about them quite so much, which is obviously encouraging them. But the fact that I read some of the things that they'd, they'd written, and they're really mature, they were, they were uh, very, very co coherent. If they're doing that, if they know what's going on in the world, that's good. It's a bit odd to be writing about transgenderism if you're a 10-year-old, isn't it? Well, it, but they're obviously hearing it all over the place and they know it's a controversial issue, the same way with Gaza. They're, they're actually hearing it, hearing it on the news. So th these kids are actually listening to the news. They may pick it up differently, TikTok or something like that. And what is going to happen? In about 10, 15, 20 years, we are going to have a thalidomide-style 
uh, scandal on our hands when people who are being encouraged to go down a particular road uh, by all this kind of nonsense are going to have their lives absolutely ruined. And I cannot understand what this person called the Secretary of State for Education does all day. I thought that uh, the government ran the education department uh, and set the ground but, rules but, for... But, but does it? Uh, uh, I mean, with well, academies, not. But with academies, don't schools have considerable independence as to what they teach? I, I still think that guidelines and there should be more than guidelines, uh, education secretaries have it within their power to set certain guidelines. We all know what is but going on. In, like we all minds, know what's going on in schools. We all know what the uh, uh, establishment... But, Michael, wing... couldn't a left-wing government use that too and set guidelines that you and I thought were disagreeable and Nigel was in favour of? The, the, this is quite dangerous to have too tight guidelines. I, I, think, I think that in about 10 or 15 years' time, as I say, the courts are going to be stuffed full of people in their teens and 20s who've been egged on and pushed down this particular path suddenly realise when, they're, when it's too late right. that their lives have been absolutely ruined. Well, sticking to education, a headmaster in Doncaster may have taken things a little too far in an attempt to crack down on truancy after he claimed staff were checking pupils' homes to determine if their absences were legitimate, specifically their bins, their dustbins. Logic follows that if the bins hadn't been put out at students' homes, it could suggest that they were secretly on holiday instead of being ill. While the headmaster, David Scales, has claimed the checks were done out of concern, some have called it invasive snooping tactics. Well, back to my panel. Um, Michael, when you were an MP, would you have wanted schools going around checking people's bins? Well, I am now. Let, OK, we're, we're, I've been a bit hard on the education establishment. I am in favour of children going to school, uh, even if they're nearly half dead. I won only one prize ever at my secondary school. I won the attendance prize. <laughs> my parents would never allow me to stay at home unless I was nearly dead. Fortunately, I'd had all my childhood illnesses of measles and all the rest of it uh, when I was at primary school. But I am on the side of teachers in wanting to get children into school uh, and, uh, and so checking uh, the bins. I, I, I rather doubt whether Doncaster is the kind of place where they're actually going uh, 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 on, on lavish holidays uh, somehow. I suspect, to be fair to the schools, there probably is a high degree of truancy, and I'm on the teacher's side on that. Right, I think there's something that I'm not very keen on, on people checking bins. I, I once got a letter from a constituent who had had a look at my dustbins and said I wasn't recycling enough, which I, I thought was the <laughs> most ridiculous letter yeah. of all the letters I've ever got from a constituent. <laughs> well, I mean, the, uh, the idea of actually sending teachers out to mount surveillance operations on parents, it sounds to me that is a dubious legality for a start. And secondly, is there not a simpler way of doing it by saying, right, we'll demand a doctor's note if, if children are absent over a, over a long period of time. Well, that, wouldn't that seem fair, right? It's, but it's also a bit Inspector Clouseau, isn't it, that you're going around, you're saying, ah, yeah. oh, see bins. Uh, OK, I, I'm prepared to concede that this particular school's methodology might not be uh, uh, in keeping with the uh, general spirit, but I do accept that truancy is out of all proportion to what it was pre-COVID, and I do accept that uh, children are probably best from the safety point of view, and not, uh, apart from anything else, in schools under supervision. And to be fair to the headmaster, even if we don't think this is the best approach, he is doing it out of goodwill and concern that he really wants to make sure people are coming oh, yeah, to school. I mean, and that's, that's yeah. a very honourable I mean, and noble I mean, thing I mean, to no be one, doing. No one can actually complain about the idea that, that children should go on holiday rather than be in school. Of course they should be in school. And it, about 117,000 kids don't go to school, and that's really serious. That's a 20% you know, rise in what it was pre-COVID. So, in summary, it's a rubbish plan, but well intended. That's it. Thank you to my panel. Coming up, free speech is fundamental. But let he who is without sin cast the first stone. On Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., Jewish students intimidated by a baying pro Palestine mob. You keep making some very, very interesting comments. You keep talking about intimidation. You keep talking about. You were talking about. I'll speak to one of the victims who is left absolutely broken. Plus, Nigel Farage reacts to the £1 million Muslim war veteran statue. Are the Tories in for a hiding after yesterday's damp squib of a budget? We have got exclusive new polling. And was India Willoughby right or wrong to report JK Rowling to the police over being called a man? Don't miss Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11pm. Be there. 
headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11pm. Is a debate on gender really a far-right issue? Far right. I'm so bored of that phrase, you know what I mean? Like, anyone who talks about... Anyone who acknowledges that there are two sexes is suddenly far right, because that's what, that's what Hitler and Mussolini were all about. Um, this, this question from Shirley is, of course, about Labour. They've been accused of being undemocratic because they pressured a pub into cancelling a debate, and this debate features Kelly J. Keane, who's been on this show a couple of times, uh, and she's a campaigner, and she was just on the panel, and then they got a letter saying that they couldn't do it because Kelly J. Keane apparently attracts far-right groups. Now, they've tried this trick before, but because some awful, ghastly neo-Nazi types turned up near to an event that she was holding in Australia, they kind of tried to blame that on her and suggest that the two were the same thing. They weren't. That was an opportunistic group turning up to... They're not... Neo-Nazis aren't pro-feminist. <laughs> they're, they're not pro an event called Let Women Speak. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> New Zealand's uh, TV uh, blurred her uh, touching her zip because they said that her touching her zip was a far-right uh, dog whistle because she's... she's She's making that symbol. Yeah, but when she, she wasn't making the symbol. Wow. She was just adjusting a zip. Yeah. And, and also, and also <laughs> this isn't a far right symbol. I mean, that's, that was incredible because she obviously wasn't making that symbol anyway. She was just adjusting a top. But this New Zealand uh, news channel blurred out the hand so that they could <laughs> pretend that it was some horrible ghastly. Yeah. I mean, well, she's, she's, just, this, we, she's talked about having voted Labour in the past. She's yeah. so not far right. But also, I mean... even if she were right wing, which she yes. isn't, why would they be banning a panel where there's a discussion about an? One of the most important issues of our day. What well, did Labour playing out here? They're anti-democratic, aren't they? They're just kind of playing whack-a-mole with things they don't like. I think yeah. maybe I'll write to the pub and say I do want to see Kelly J. Keane there. Yeah, but it's... they won't listen to you well, if no, you say that, will they? Because you've got the unfashionable opinion, Chris. Well, I'm the unfashionable workplace. <laughs> I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. While I may have given the impression that Somerset is an idyllic paradise, a heaven on earth in which the hills endlessly roll off into burnt orange sunsets with the gentle bleating of sheep echoing in the distance, news coming from God's own county isn't on this occasion entirely propitious. Last June, two preachers were arrested in Glastonbury. Now, Glastonbury is the most Christian place in the country. Christ himself was thought to have visited there with Joseph of Arimathea. And in Glastonbury, in Somerset, under Section 35 of the Anti-Social Behaviour Crime and Policing Act 2014, complaints were made from the public about a preacher who was preaching against homosexuality and transgenderism. However, yesterday, the Crown Prosecution Service dropped its case against the two individuals on the grounds that there were no evidence for the charges. So I want to defend the right of people to say what they think, but also to question whether it's Christian to be judging people and accusing them of sin. So here's a taste of what happened. As long as you don't make me look silly when I turn away and you go, look at this copper, he's an absolute idiot, and I'm not listening because I'm dealing don't with Don't worry about what they think of you. Come on, you're a man. Get up, straighten that chest up, and now... I'm going to challenge that because you don't know whether I'm a man or a female. I'm going to challenge... I'm going to challenge... I'm going to challenge that there's no such other thing than male and female. Well, with me now is one of the preachers himself, Sean O'Sullivan. Sean, first of all, thank you for coming in. God bless you, Jacob. Thank you, and God bless you too. Tell me, what were you doing, first of all? So I was just... Um, I went there to preach about Jesus. I um, was saved uh, very radically. So I wanted to go to Glastonbury with the message of turn to God, of righteousness, and I was arrested. 
And Glastonbury, as I said in the introduction, is one of the most Christian sites uh, in England. The legends around Glastonbury yes. are remarkable and Glastonbury Abbey and the continuing tradition. So you were choosing it as a Christian pilgrimage site to go Yes, because I travel across all the UK. And what were you saying about homosexuality and transgenderism? I said, so I said uh, about that it was sin, according to God. Now, all of us have sinned. None of us, myself included, uh, we are all guilty before God. So I said there is sin according to the Bible. Now, it's up to people to receive that or not. I don't hate people, mm -hmm. but I believe that the Bible, the King James Bible, well, is clear. I've brought a Bible with me. Oh. And it's math But Matthew 7 is the bit that says, do not judge others. Yes. And, you know, it's the motes and beams taking the yes. moat out of your brother's eye when there's a beam in yours. Do you feel that by focusing on homosexuality, you were taking the speck out of the other's eye? Well, no, I didn't um, just focus on that. And if you read on a bit further down, it tells you when you take the log out that you can now see and then warn your brother. That's right. Thou shalt have so, clear sight to rid thy brother of the speck. Yeah, so I can't make a judgment off my own back. I have to go by the word of God. Yes. Um, and so what were you saying that... that you were quoting the Bible. Yes. But what's interesting is why specifically on homosexuality? Why not the Ten Commandments, which is the basis of all our understanding of sin? OK, so I said that adultery is sin. I said homosexuality. I said drunkenness, which I used to be an alcoholic. I said, according to God, we cannot enter his kingdom. This is why the cross, this is why we have Jesus. He gave his life as a sacrifice for people who have sinned against God's ways, that he would perfect us and make us walk towards his way. So I mean, it's actually all have sinned. It's not just one group, particular group. That you were talking about. Yes. Um, and you were exercising your right to freedom of speech. Yes. The policeman came up. How did they then treat you? Well... <laughs> They didn't seem to understand why they were there. They were um and ahhing, as I've, you know, seen a lot. I preached a lot of places last year. The police seem to... Someone seems to get offended in the crowd, so the police seem to say, oh, well, he's offended, someone's broke the law. Well, we know that not to be true. Um, just if you feel offended by what I say, it doesn't mean I've committed a crime. And, and you were being accused of a hate crime. Yes, a hate crime. And so what they did is they gave me a public um, antisocial order to leave the area. Now, I refused to leave because I'd not committed a crime. I preached that the Bible, which this country swore by, the King James Bible, was swore on. Well, tell me about your journey to Christianity, how you came to believe in Christ. OK, so I was a very devout atheist. I was a heckler of the gospel. I was actually a seven-stone heroin addict, armed robber, spent many years in Her Majesty's prison, which I deserved, and I deserved a longer sentence, to be honest. Um, I used to heckle a street preacher, John Dunn, the guy that was arrested with me, and I used to really mock him for about six, seven years. I went on to get radically born again, at the end of my life, I wanted to end it all. I had enough of life. And I come to a place to receive my own sin and see the grace and the power of the cross. And it truly changed me. And that's been many years now. I've been blessed to have a wife, children. And I've gone on to see many people come out of drug addiction, people who have now surrendered knives, people who have come out of gangs, people who have, who have really suffered in this world. And that's my message. It is of love, but I know that... A lot of people will not receive it like And the that. understanding that we are all sinners... We are all sinners. ..but Christ's love will forgive us. Christ's love will forgive us, but to, we have to tell the truth, and that's what the Bible says, to warn people, to lift up your voice. Thank you very much indeed for joining me and for sharing your story, Sean. Yes. Um, that's all from me. Up next, it's Patrick Christie's. Patrick, what is on your bill of fare this evening? Well, can I just start by saying what a fantastic segment that was, actually. Really enjoyed it. But, um, yeah, I'll have to be snappy now. I've got some shocking extremism videos to reveal to the nation. I'm also talking about Welby. He says he needs a panic alarm, but are we the ones in danger? And it's Rowling versus Willoughby, round 858. Oh, well, that all sounds very exciting, and I hope you won't need a panic alarm. Uh, that'll be after the weather. I'll be back on Monday at 8 o'clock. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg. This has been State of the Nation. And although we may have had a problem in Glastonbury, actually Somerset remains God's own county, and the weather there, which you're going to be hearing in a moment, will be the most beautiful sunshine, even reflected by the moon. It will be the most beautiful light you can possibly imagine in the finest county in the world. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar.
with sponsors of weather on GB News. Good evening. Here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. A few showers and a touch of frost for some of us tonight, then a mostly fine day tomorrow. At the moment, the UK is sandwiched in between low pressure around the Bay of Biscay and high pressure across Scandinavia, leading to a strengthening southeasterly flow. Through the night, we are going to see a few showers, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland. Also, some showery outbreaks for northeast England and eastern parts of Scotland. Could be a little bit of sleet or snow over the higher ground here. Elsewhere, a mostly dry picture with some clear skies, particularly towards the south of England, also western Scotland, under which we could see a touch of frost first thing on Friday morning in any sheltered rural spots. Otherwise, as we go through tomorrow then, any showery outbreaks across northern areas will largely die out. So for much of the country, it will be a dry picture by the afternoon with a decent amount of sunshine across much of England, Wales and also western parts of Scotland. But that southeasterly wind will be bringing in some cloud, which is likely to link across eastern northeastern parts and a significant wind chill will make it feel pretty cold under that cloud too. Looking ahead to the weekend and after a dry start for most on Saturday, a weather system pushing its way up from the southwest will lead to a fairly wet story for many of us as we go through the weekend. The rain likely to be heaviest and most frequent across southern areas. Further north it's probably going to be a bit patchier, a bit more showery and mostly light too. Temperatures picking up on Saturday dropping down again. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. We're springing into spring and giving you the chance to win the seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package to enjoy, including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £45 in tax-free cash, text